Chapter Number Seventy of the Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Out Loud. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Out Loud by francis jenkins olcott little tiny there was once a woman who wished very much to have a little child so she went to fairy so she went to a fairy and said i should so very much like to have a little child can you tell me where i may find one? Oh, that is easily managed said the fairy here is a barley corn of a different kind to those which grow in the farmer's fields and which the chickens eat put it in a flower pot and see what will happen thank you said the woman and she gave the fairy twelve shillings which was the price of the barley corn then she went home and planted it and immediately there grew up a large handsome flower something like a tulip in appearance but with its leaves tightly closed as if it was still a bud it is a beautiful flower said the woman and she kissed the red and golden covered leaves and while she did so the flower opened and she could see that it was a real tulip within the flower upon the green velvet stamens sat a very delicate and graceful little maiden she was scarcely half as long as a thumb and they gave her the name of little thumb or tiny because she was so small a walnut shell elegantly polished served her for a cradle her bed was formed of blue violet leaves with a rose leaf for a counterpane here she slept at night but during the day she amused herself on a table where the woman had placed a plateful of water round this plate were wreaths of flowers with their stems in the water and upon it floated a large tulip leaf which served tiny for a boat here the little maiden sat and rowed herself from side to side with two oars made of white horse hair it really was a very pretty sight tiny could also sing so softly and sweetly that nothing like her singing had ever before been heard one night while she lay in her pretty bed a large ugly wet toad crept through a broken pane of glass in the window and leaped right up on the table where tiny lay sleeping under her rose leaf quilt what a pretty little wife this would make for my son said the toad and she took up the walnut shell in which little tiny lay asleep and jumped through the window with it into the garden in the swampy margin of a broad stream in the garden lived the toad with her son he was uglier even than his mother and when he saw the pretty little maiden in her elegant bed he could only cry croak 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 don't speak so loud or she will wake said the toad and then she might run away for she is as light as swans down we will place her on one of the water lily leaves out in the stream it will be like an island to her she is so light and small and then she cannot escape and while she is away we will make haste and prepare the stateroom under the marsh in which you are to live when you are married far out in the stream grew a number of water lilies with broad green leaves which seemed to float on top of the water the largest of these leaves appeared farther off than the rest and the old toad swam out to it with the walnut shell in which little tiny lay still asleep the little creature woke very early in the morning and began to cry bitterly when she found where she was for she could see nothing but water on every side of the large green leaf 
and no way of reaching the land. Meanwhile, the old toad was very busy under the marsh, decking her room with rushes and wild yellow flowers, to make it look pretty for her new daughter-in-law. Then she swam out with her ugly son to the leaf which she had placed poor little Tiny. She wanted to fetch the pretty bed, that she might put it in the bridal chamber to be ready for her. The old toad bowed low to her in the water and said, Here is my son, he will be your husband, and you will live happily together in the marsh by the stream. Croak, 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 was all her son could say for himself. So the toad took up the elegant little bed and swam away with it, leaving Tiny all alone on the green leaf, where she sat and wept. She could not bear to think of living with the old toad and having her ugly son for a husband. The little fishes who swam about in the water had seen the toad and heard what she said, so they lifted their heads above the water to look at the little maiden. As soon as they caught sight of her, they saw she was very pretty, and it made them sorry to think that she must go and live with the ugly toads. No, it must never be. So they assembled together in the water round the green stalk, which held the leaf on which the little maiden stood, and gnawed it away at the root with their teeth. Then the leaf floated down the stream, carrying Tiny far away. Tiny sailed past many towns, and the little birds in the bushes saw her and sang, What a lovely little creature! So the leaf swam away with her farther and farther, till it brought her to other lands. A graceful little white butterfly constantly fluttered round her, and at last alighted on the leaf. Tiny pleased him, and she was glad of it for now the toad could not possibly reach her, and the country through which she sailed was beautiful, and the sun shone upon the water, till it glittered like liquid gold. She took off her girdle and tied one end of it round the butterfly, and the other end of the ribbon she fastened to the leaf, which now glided on much faster than ever taking little Tiny with it as she stood. Presently, a large cockchafer flew by. The moment he caught sight of her, he seized her round her delicate waist with his claws and flew with her into a tree. The green leaf floated away on the brook, and the butterfly flew with it, for he was fastened to it and could not get away. Oh, how frightened little Tiny felt when the cockchafer flew with her to the tree. But especially she was sorry for the beautiful white butterfly, which she had fastened to the leaf, for if he could not free himself, he would die of hunger. But the cockchafer did not trouble himself at all about the matter. He seated himself by her side on the large green leaf and gave her some honey from the flowers to eat and told her she was very pretty, though not in the least like a cockchafer. After a time, all the cockchafers who lived in the tree came to visit her. They stared at Tiny, and then the young lady cockchafers turned up their feelers and said, she has only two legs how ugly that looks she has no feelers said another her waist is quite slim pooh she is like a human being oh she is ugly said all the lady cockchafers although tiny was very pretty thus the cockchafer who had run away with her believed all the others when they said she was ugly and would have nothing more to say to her, and told her she might go where she liked. Then he flew down with her from the tree, and placed her on a daisy, and she wept at the thought that she was so ugly that even the cockchafers 
would have nothing to say to her and all the while she was really the loveliest creature that one could imagine and as tender and delicate as a beautiful rose leaf during the whole summer poor little tiny lived quite alone in the wide forest she wove herself a bed with blades of grass and hung it up under a broad leaf to protect herself from the rain she sucked the honey from the flowers for food and drank the dew from their leaves every morning so passed away the summer and the autumn and then came the winter the long cold winter all the birds who had sung to her so sweetly were flown away and the trees and flowers had withered the large clover leaf under the shelter of which she had lived was now rolled together and shriveled up nothing remained but a yellow withered stalk she felt dreadfully cold for her clothes were torn and she was herself so frail and delicate that poor little thing she was nearly frozen to death it began to snow too and the snowflakes as they fell upon her were like a whole shovelful falling upon one of us for we are tall but she was only an inch high then she wrapped herself up in a dry leaf but it cracked in the middle and could not keep her warm and she shivered with cold near the wood in which she had been living lay a large cornfield but the corn had been cut a long time nothing remained but the bare dry stubble standing up out of the frozen ground it was to her like struggling through a large wood oh how she shivered with the cold she came at last to the door of a field mouse who had a little den under the corn stubble there dwelt the field mouse in warmth and comfort with a whole roomful of corn a kitchen and a beautiful dining room poor little tiny stood before the door just like a little beggar girl and begged for a small piece of barley corn for she had been without a morsel to eat for two days you poor little creature said the field mouse who was really a good old field mouse come into my warm room and dine with me she was very pleased with tiny so she said you are quite welcome to stay with me all the winter if you like but you must keep my rooms clean and neat and tell me stories for i shall like to hear them very much and tiny did all the field mouse asked of her and found herself very comfortable we shall have a visitor soon said the field mouse one day my neighbor pays me a visit once a week he is better off than i am he has large rooms and wears a beautiful black velvet coat if you could only have him for a husband you would be well provided for indeed but he is blind so you must tell him some of your prettiest stories but tiny did not feel at all interested about this neighbor for he was a mole however he came and paid his visit dressed in his black velvet coat he is very rich and learned and his house is twenty times larger than mine said the field mouse he was rich and learned no doubt but he always spoke slightingly of the sun and the pretty flowers because he had never seen them tiny was obliged to sing to him lady bird lady bird fly away home and many other pretty songs and the mole fell in love with her because she had such a sweet voice but he said nothing yet for he was very cautious a short time before the mole had dug a long passage under the earth which led from the dwelling of the field mouse to his own and here she had permission to walk with tiny whenever she liked but he warned them not to be alarmed at the sight of a dead bird which lay in the passage it was a perfect bird with a beak and feathers and could not have been dead long 
and was lying just where the mole had made his passage the mole took a piece of phosphorescent wood in his mouth and it glittered like fire in the dark then he went before them to light them through the long dark passage when they came to the spot where lay the dead bird the mole pushed his broad nose through the ceiling the earth gave way so that there was a large hole and the daylight shone into the passage in the middle of the floor lay the dead swallow his beautiful wings pulled close to his sides his feet and his head drawn up under his feathers the poor bird had evidently died of the cold it made little tiny very sad to see it she did so love the little birds all the summer they had sung and twittered for her so beautifully but the mole pushed it aside with his crooked legs and said he will sing no more now how miserable it must be to be born a little bird i am thankful that none of my children will ever be birds for they can do nothing but cry tweet tweet and always die of hunger in the winter yes you may well say that you clever man exclaimed the field mouse what is the use of his twittering for when winter comes he must either starve or be frozen to death still birds are very high bred tiny said nothing but when the others had turned their backs on the bird she stooped down and stroked aside the soft feathers which covered the head and kissed the closed eyelids perhaps this was the one who sang to me so sweetly in the summer she said and know how much pleasure it gave me you dear pretty bird the mole now stopped up the hole through which the daylight shone and then accompanied tiny and the field mouse home but during the night tiny could not sleep so she got out of bed and wove a large beautiful carpet of hay then she carried it to the dead bird and spread it over him with some down from the flowers which she had found in the field mouse's room the down was as soft as wool and she spread some of it on either side of the bird so that he might lie warmly in the cold earth farewell you pretty little bird said she farewell thank you for your delightful singing during the summer when all the trees were green and the warm sun shone upon us then she laid her head on the bird's breast but she was alarmed immediately for it seemed as if something inside the bird went thump thump it was the bird's heart he was not really dead only benumbed with the cold and the warmth had restored him to life in autumn all the swallows fly away into warm countries but if one happens to linger the cold seizes it it becomes frozen and falls down as if dead it remains where it fell and the cold snow covers it tiny trembled very much she was quite frightened for the bird was large a great deal larger than herself she was only an inch high but she took courage laid the wool more thickly over the poor swallow and then took a leaf which she had used for her own counterpane and laid it over the head of the poor bird the next morning she again stole out to see him he was alive but very weak he could only open his eyes for a moment to look at tiny who stood by holding a piece of decayed wood in her hand for she had no other lantern thank you pretty little maiden said the sick swallow i have been so nicely warmed that i shall soon regain my strength and be able to fly about in the warm sunshine oh she said it is cold out of doors now it snows and freezes stay in your warm bed 
I will take care of you." Then she brought the swallow some water in a flower leaf, and after he had drunk, he told her that he had wounded one of his wings in a thorn bush and could not fly so fast as the other birds, who were soon far away on their journey to warm countries. Then at last he had fallen to the earth and could remember no more nor how he came to be where she had found him the whole winter the swallow remained underground and tiny nursed him with care and love neither the mole nor the field mouse knew anything about it for they did not like swallows very soon the springtime came and the sun warmed the earth then the swallow bade farewell to tiny and she opened the hole in the ceiling which the mole had made the sun shone in upon them so beautifully that the swallow asked her if she would go with him she could sit on his back he said and he would fly away with her into the green woods but tiny knew it would make the field mouse very grieved if she left her in that manner so she said no i cannot farewell then farewell you good pretty little maiden said the swallow and he flew out into the sunshine tiny looked after him and the tears rose in her eyes she was very fond of the poor swallow tweet tweet sang the bird as he flew out into the green woods and tiny felt sad she was not allowed to go out into the warm sunshine the corn which had been sown in the field over the house of the field mouse had grown up high in the air and formed a thick wood to tiny who was only an inch high you are going to be married tiny said the field mouse my neighbor has asked for you what good fortune for a poor child like you now we will prepare your wedding clothes they must be both woolen and linen nothing must be wanting when you are the mole's wife tiny had to turn the spindle and the field mouse hired four spiders who were to weave day and night every evening the mole visited her and was continually speaking of the time when the summer would be over then he would keep his wedding day with tiny but now the heat of the sun was so great it burned the earth and made it quite hard like a stone as soon as the summer was over the wedding should take place but tiny was not at all pleased for she did not like the tiresome mole every morning when the sun rose and every evening when it went down she would creep out at the door and as the wind blew aside the ears of corn so that she could see the blue sky she thought how beautiful and bright it seemed out there and wished so much to see her dear swallow again but he never returned for by this time he had flown far away into the lovely green forest when autumn arrived tiny had her outfit quite ready and the field mouse said to her in four weeks the wedding must take place then tiny wept and said she would not marry the disagreeable mole nonsense replied the field mouse now don't be obstinate or i shall bite you with my white teeth he is a very handsome mole the queen herself does not wear more beautiful velvets and furs his kitchen and cellars are quite full you ought to be very thankful for such good fortune so the wedding day was fixed on which the mole was to fetch tiny away to live with him deep under the earth and never again to see the warm sun because he did not like it the poor child was most unhappy at the thought of saying where farewell to the beautiful sun and as the field mouse had given her permission to stand at the door she went to look at it once more farewell bright sun she cried 
stretching out her arm towards it and then she walked a short distance from the house for the corn had been cut and only the dry stubble remained in the fields farewell farewell she repeated twining her arm round a little red flower that grew just by her side greet the little swallow from me if you shall see him again tweet tweet sounded over her head suddenly she looked up and there was the swallow himself flying close by as soon as he spied tiny he was delighted and then she told him how unwilling she felt to marry the ugly mole and to live always beneath the earth and never to see the bright sun any more and as she told him she wept cold winter is coming said the swallow and i'm going to fly away into warmer countries will you go with me you can sit on my back and fasten yourself on with your sash then we can fly away from the ugly mole and his gloomy rooms far away over the mountains into warmer countries where the sun shines more brightly than here where it is always summer and the flowers bloom in greater beauty fly now with me dear little tiny you saved my life when i lay frozen in that dark dreary passage yes i will go with you said tiny and she seated herself on the bird's back with her feet on his outstretched wings and tied her girdle to one of his strongest feathers then the swallow rose in the air and flew over forest and over sea high above the highest mountains covered with eternal snow tiny would have been frozen in the cold air but she crept under the bird's warm feathers keeping her little head uncovered so that she might admire the beautiful lands over which they passed at length they reached the warm countries where the sun shines brightly and the sky seems so much higher above the earth here on the hedges and by the wayside grew purple green and white grapes lemons and oranges hung from trees in the woods and the air was fragrant with myrtles and orange blossoms beautiful children ran along the country lanes playing with large gay butterflies and as the swallow flew farther and farther every place appeared still more lovely at last they came to a blue lake and by the side of it shaded by trees of the deepest green stood a palace of dazzling white marble built in the olden times vines clustered round its lofty pillars and at the top were many swallows nests and one of these was the home of the swallow who carried tiny this is my house said the swallow but it would not do for you to live there you would not be comfortable you must choose for yourself one of those lovely flowers and i will put you down upon it and then you shall have everything that you can wish to make you happy that will be delightful she said and clapped her little hands for joy a large marble pillar lay on the ground which in falling had been broken into three pieces between these pieces grew the most beautiful large white flowers so the swallow flew down with tiny and placed her on one of the broad leaves but how surprised she was to see in the middle of the flowers a tiny little man as white and transparent as if he had been made of crystal he had a gold crown on his head and delicate wings at his shoulders and was not much larger than tiny herself he was the fairy of the flower for a tiny man and a tiny woman dwell in every flower and this was the king of them all oh how beautiful he is whispered tiny to the swallow the little king was at first quite frightened at the bird 
who was like a giant compared to such a delicate little creature as himself but when he saw tiny he was delighted and thought her the prettiest little maiden he had ever seen he took the gold crown from his head and placed it on hers and asked her name and if she would be his wife and queen over all the flowers this certainly was a very different sort of husband to the son of the toad or the mole with his black velvet and fur so she said yes to the handsome king then all the flowers opened and out of each came a little lady or tiny lord all so pretty it was quite a pleasure to look at them each of them brought tiny a present but the best gift was a pair of beautiful wings which had belonged to a large white fly and they fastened them to tiny's shoulders so that she might fly from flower to flower then there was much rejoicing and the little swallow who sat above them in his nest was asked to sing a wedding song which he did as well as he could but in his heart he felt sad for he was very fond of tiny and would have liked never to part from her again you must not be called tiny any more said the fairy of the flowers to her it is an ugly name and you are so very pretty we will call you maya farewell farewell said the swallow with a heavy heart as he left the warm countries to fly back into denmark there he had a nest over the window of a house in which dwelt the writer of fairy tales the swallow sang tweet tweet and from his song came this whole story hans christian anderson end of chapter seventy recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter number seventy one of the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud by Francis Jenkins Olcott The Immortal Fountain In ancient times two little princesses lived in Scotland, one of whom was extremely beautiful, and the other dwarfish, dark-colored and deformed one was named rose and the other marion the sisters did not live happily together marion hated rose because the latter was handsome and everybody praised her so marion scowled and her face grew absolutely black when anybody asked how her pretty sister was and once she was so wicked and jealous that she cut off all Rose's glossy golden hair and threw it in the fire. Poor Rose cried bitterly about it, but she did not scold or strike her sister, for she was an amiable and gentle little being. No wonder, then, that all the family and all the neighbors disliked Marion, and no wonder that her face grew uglier and uglier every day. But the neighbors used to say that rose had been blessed by the fairies to whom she owed her extraordinary beauty and goodness not far from the castle where the princesses resided was a deep grotto said to lead to the palace of beauty where the queen of the fairies held her court some said that rose had fallen asleep there one day when she was tired of chasing a butterfly and that the queen had dipped her in an immortal fountain from which she had risen with the beauty of an angel marion often asked rose about this story but the child always replied that she was forbidden to speak of it 
when rose saw any uncommon bird or butterfly she would exclaim oh how much that looks like fairyland but when asked what she knew about fairyland she blushed and would not answer marion thought a great deal about this why can i not go to the palace of beauty thought she and why may i not bathe in the immortal fountain one summer's noon when all was still save the faint twitterings of birds and the lazy hum of bees marion entered the deep grotto she sat down on a bank of moss the air around her was as fragrant as it came from a bed of violets and with the far-off sound of music in her ears she fell into a gentle slumber when she awoke it was evening and she found herself in a small hall where opal pillars supported a rainbow roof the bright reflection of which rested on crystal walls and on a golden floor inlaid with pearls all around between the opal pillars stood the tiniest vases of pure alabaster in which grew a multitude of brilliant and fragrant flowers some of which twinning around the pillars were lost in the floating rainbow above this scene of beauty was lighted by millions of fireflies glittering in the air like wandering stars when marion was gazing in amazement at all this a little lady of rare loveliness stood before her her robe was of green and gold her flowing gossamer mantle was caught upon one shoulder with a pearl and in her hair was a solitary star composed of five diamonds each no bigger than a pin point she smiled at marion and sang the fairy queen hath rarely seen creature of earthly mould within her door on pearly floor inlaid with shimmering gold mortal all thou seest is fair quick thy purposes declare as she concluded the song was taken up and thrice repeated by a multitude of soft voices in the distance it seemed as if birds and insects joined in the chorus and ever and anon between the pauses the sound of a cascade was heard whose waters fell in music all these delightful sounds died away and the queen of the fairies stood patiently awaiting marion's answer curtsying low and with a trembling voice the little maiden said will it please your majesty to make me as handsome as my sister rose the queen smiled again i will grant your request said she if you will promise to fulfill the, all the conditions i propose marion eagerly promised that she would the immortal fountain continued the queen is on the top of a high steep hill at four different places fairies are stationed around it who guard it with their wands none can pass except those who obey my orders go home now for one week speak no ungentle word to your sister at the end of that time come again to the grotto marion went home light of heart rose was in the garden watering flowers and the first thing marion observed was that her sister's sunny hair had grown as long and beautiful as before it was cut off the sight made her angry and she was just about to snatch the watering pot from rose's hand with cross words when she remembered the fairy and passed into the castle in silence the end of the week arrived and marion had faithfully kept her promise again she entered the grotto the queen was feasting when marion reached the hall with opal pillars the bees had brought as a gift golden honey and placed it on small rose-colored shells which adorned a crystal table bright butterflies floated about the head of the queen and fanned her with their wings 
fireflies flew near to give her light and a large diamond beetle formed her footstool after she had supped a dewdrop on a violent petal was brought to her to bathe her royal fingers behind the queen's chair hovered numerous bright fairies but when marion entered the diamond sparkles on their wings faded as they always do in the presence of anything bad and in a second all the queen's attendants vanished singing as they went the fairy queen hath rarely seen creature of mortal mould within her door on pearly floor inlaid with shining gold mortal have you fulfilled your promise asked the queen i have replied the maiden then follow me marion did as she was directed and away they hastened over beds of violets and mignonette birds sang butterflies fluttered and the voices of many fountains came on the breeze presently they reached the hill on top of which was the immortal fountain the foot of the hill was surrounded by a band of fairies clothed in green gossamer and with their ivory wands crossed to bar the ascent the queen waved her wand over them and immediately they stretched their transparent wings and flew away the hill was steep and far far up climbed the queen and marion the air became more and more fragrant and more and more distinctly they heard the sound of waters falling in music at length they were stopped by another band of fairies clothed in blue gossamer with silver wands crossed here said the queen our journey must end you can go no farther until you have fulfilled the orders i shall give you go home now for one month do by your sister as you would wish her to do by you if you were rose and she marion marion promised and departed she found the task harder than the first had been when rose asked her for playthings she found it hard to give them gently and affectionately when rose talked to her she wanted to go away in silence and when a pocket mirror was found in her sister's room broken into a thousand pieces she felt sorely tempted to conceal that she had done the mischief but she was so anxious to be made beautiful that she did as she wished to be done by all the household remarked how marion had changed i love her dearly said rose she is so good and amiable so do i said a dozen voices marion blushed deeply and her eyes sparkled with pleasure how pleasant it is to be loved thought she at the end of the month she went to the grotto again again the fairy queen conducted her up the hill and this time the fairies in blue lowered their silver wands and flew away the two traveled on higher and higher the path grew steeper and steeper but the fragrant air became more delicious and more distinctly was heard the sound of waters falling in music at length their course was stayed by a troop of fairies clothed in rainbow robes and holding silver wands tipped with gold in face and form they were far more beautiful than anything marion had yet seen here we must pause said the queen this boundary you cannot yet pass why not asked the impatient marion because those who pass the rainbow fairies must be very pure replied the queen am i not very pure asked the maiden all the people in the castle tell me how good i have grown mortal eyes see only the outside answered the queen but those who pass the rainbow fairies must be pure in thought as well as action go home now for three months never indulge in a wicked or envious thought you shall then have a glimpse of the immortal fountain marion returned home 
At the end of three months she again visited the hall with opal pillars. The queen did not smile when she saw her, but in silence led the way up the hill toward the immortal fountain. The green fairies and the blue fairies flew away as they approached, but the rainbow fairies bowed low to the queen and kept their gold-tipped wands firmly crossed. Marion saw that the silver specks on the fairies' wings began to grow dim, and she burst into tears. I know, said the queen, that you could not pass this boundary. Envy has been in your heart, but be not discouraged. For years you have been indulging in wrong feelings, and you must not wonder if it takes many months to drive them out. Go home and try once more. So poor Marion went sadly away, and when she visited the hall again, the queen smiled and touched her playfully with her wand. She then led her up the hill to the immortal fountain. The silver specks on the wings of the rainbow fairies shone bright as Marion approached, and the fairies lowered their wings and flew away. Now, Every footstep was on flowers that yielded beneath the feet like a pathway of clouds. The delicious fragrance could almost be felt, and loud and clear and sweet came the sound of waters falling in music, and now Marion could see a cascade leaping and sparkling over crystal rocks. Above it rested a rainbow. The spray fell in pearls forming delicate foliage around the margin of the fountain, and deep and silent below the foam of the cascade was the immortal fountain of beauty. Its amber-colored waves flowed over a golden bed, and many fairies were bathing in its waves, the diamonds in their hair gleaming like sunbeams on the water. Oh, let me bathe in the fountain, cried Marion, clapping her hands in delight. Not yet, said the queen. Behold the purple fairies with golden wands that guard its brink. Marion looked and saw beings lovelier than her eye had ever rested on. You cannot pass them yet, said the queen. Go home, for one year drive from your heart all evil feelings, not for the sake of bathing in this fountain, but because goodness is lovely and desirable for its own sake. Then your work is done. Marion returned home. This was the hardest task of all, for she had been willing to be good, not because it was right, but because she wished to be beautiful. Three times she sought the grotto, and three times she left in tears, for the golden specks on the wings of the purple fairies grew dim as she approached, and the golden wands were still cross to shut her from the immortal fountain. But the fourth time the purple fairies lowered their wands, singing, Thou hast scaled the mountain, go bathe in the fountain, rise fair to the sight, as an angel of light. Go bathe in the fountain. Marion, full of joy, was about to plunge in, but the queen touched her, saying, Look in the mirror of the water. Art thou not already as beautiful as heart can wish? Marion looked at herself and saw that her eyes sparkled with new luster. A bright color shone in her cheeks. Her hair waved softly about her face and dimples played sweetly around her mouth. But I have not touched the immortal fountain, cried she, turning in surprise to the queen. True, replied the queen, but its waters have been within your soul. Know that a pure and happy heart and gentleness towards others are the only immortal fountains of beauty. Marion thanked the queen and joyfully returned home. Rose ran to meet her and clasped her to her bosom feverently. I know all, she said. I have been in fairyland, disguised as a bird. I have watched all your steps. When you first went to the grotto, 
I beg the queen to grant your wish. Ever after the sisters lived longingly together. It was the remark of every one. How handsome Marion has grown! The ugly scowl has departed from her face. Her eyes are so clear and gentle. Her mouth is so pretty and smiling. To my taste, she is as handsome as Rose. Lydia Maria Child Adopted End of Chapter 71 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 72 of the Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud by Francis Jenkins Olcott. The Story of Child Charity. Once upon a time there lived in the west country a little girl who had neither father nor mother. They both died when she was very young, and left their daughter to the care of her uncle, who was the richest farmer in all that country. He had houses and lands, flocks and herds, many servants to work about his house and fields, a wife who had brought him a great dowry and two fair daughters. All their neighbours, being poor, looked up to the family, insomuch that they imagined themselves great people. The father and mother were as proud as peacocks, the daughters thought themselves the greatest beauties in the world, and not one of the family would speak civilly to anybody they thought low. Now it happened that though she was their near relation, they had this opinion of the orphan girl, partly because she had no fortune, and partly because of her humble, kindly disposition. It was said that the more needy and despised any creature was, the more ready was she to befriend it, on which account the people of the West Country called her child charity and if she had any other name, I never heard it. Child Charity was thought very mean in that proud house. Her uncle would not own her for his niece, her cousins would not keep her company, and her aunt sent her to work in a dairy, and to sleep in the back garret, where they kept all sorts of lumber and dry herbs for the winter. The servants learned the same tune, and Child Charity had more work than rest among them. All the day she scoured pails, scrubbed dishes, and washed crockery ware, but every night she slept in the back garret as sound as a princess could in her palace chamber. Her uncle's house was large and white, and stood among green meadows by a riverside. In front it had a porch covered with a vine, behind it had a farmyard and high granaries. Within there were two parlors for the rich, and two kitchens for the poor, which the neighbors thought wonderfully grand. And one day in the harvest season, when this rich farmer's corn had been all cut down and housed, he condescended so far as to invite his neighborhood to a harvest supper. The West Country people came in their holiday clothes and best behavior. Such heaps of cakes and cheese, such baskets of apples and barrels of ale, had never been a feast before. They were making merry in kitchen and parlor, when a poor old woman came to the back door, begging for broken victuals and night's lodging. Her clothes were coarse and ragged, her hair was scanty and grey, her back was bent, her teeth were gone. She had a squinting eye, a clubbed foot, and crooked fingers. In short, she was the poorest and ugliest old woman that ever came begging. The first who saw her was the kitchen maid, and she ordered her to be gone for an ugly witch. The next was the herd boy, and he threw her a bone over his shoulder. The child Charity, hearing the noise, came out from her seat at the foot of the lowest table, and asked the old woman to take her share of the supper, and sleep that night in her bed in the back garret. The old woman sat down without a word of thanks. All the company laughed at child Charity for giving her bed and her supper to a beggar. Her proud cousin said it was just like her mean spirit, but child Charity did not mind him. She scraped the pots for her supper that night, and slept on a sack among the lumber, while the old woman rested in her warm bed. And the next morning, before the girl awoke, the old woman was up and gone, without so much as saying thank you or good morning. That day all the servants were sick after the feast, and mostly cross too, so you may judge how civil they were. 
when at supper time who should come back to the door but the old woman again asking for broken victuals and a night's lodging no one would listen to her or give her a morsel till child charity rose from her seat at the foot of the lowest table and kindly asked her to take her supper and sleep in her bed in the back garret again the old woman sat down without the word child charity scraped the pots for her supper and slept on the sack in the morning the old woman was gone but for six nights after as sure as the supper was spread there she was at the back door and the little girl regularly asked her in child charity's aunt said she would let her get enough of beggars her cousins made continual game of what they called her genteel visitor sometimes the old woman said child why don't you make this bed softer and why are your blankets so thin but she never gave her a word of thanks nor a civil good morning at last on the ninth day from her first coming when child charity was getting used to scrape the pots and sleep on the sack her accustomed knock came at the door and there she stood with an ugly ashy-coloured dog so stupid-looking and clumsy that no hurt boy would keep him good evening my little girl she said when child charity opened the door i will not have your supper in bed to-night i am going on a long journey to see a friend but here is a dog of mine whom nobody in all the west country will keep for me he is a little cross and not very handsome but i leave him to your care till the shortest day in all the year then you and i will count for his keeping when the old woman had said the last word she set off with such speed that child charity lost sight of her in a minute the ugly dog began to fawn upon her but he snarled at everybody else the servants said he was a disgrace to the house the proud cousins wanted him drowned and it was with great trouble that child charity got leave to keep him in an old ruined cow-house ugly and cross as the dog was he fawned on her and the old woman had left him to her care so the little girl gave him part of all her meals and when the hard frost came took him privately to her own back garret because the cow-house was damp and cold in the long nights the dog lay quietly on some straw in the corner child charity slept soundly but every morning the servants would say to her what great light and fine talking was that in your back garret there was no light but the moon shining in through the shutterless window and no talk that i heard said child charity and she thought they must have been dreaming but night after night when any of them awoke in the dark and silent hour that comes before the morning they saw a light brighter and clearer than the christmas fire and heard voices like those of lords and ladies in the back garret partly from fear and partly from laziness none of the servants would rise to see what might be there at length when the winter nights were at the longest the little parlour maid who did least work and got most favour because she gathered news for her mistress crept out of bed when all the rest were sleeping and set herself to watch at the crevice of the door she saw the dog lying quietly in the corner child charity sleeping soundly in her bed and the moon shining through the shutterless window but an hour before daybreak there came a glare of nights and a sound of far-off bugles the window opened and in marched a troop of little men clothed in crimson and gold and bearing every man a torch till the room looked bright as day they marched up with great reverence to the dog where he lay on the straw and the most richly clothed among them said royal prince we have prepared the banquet hall what will your highness please that we do next ye have done well said the dog now prepare the feast and see that all things be in our first fashion for the princess and i mean to bring a stranger who never feasted in our halls before your highness's commands shall be obeyed said the little man making another reverence and he and his company passed out of the window by and by there was another glare of lights and a sound like far-off flutes the window opened and there came in a company of little ladies clad in rose-coloured velvet and carrying each a crystal lamp they also walked with great reverence up to the dog and the gayest among them said royal prince we have prepared the tapestry what will your highness please that we do next ye have done well said the dog now prepare the robes and let all things be in our first fashion for the princess and i will bring with us a stranger who never feasted in our halls before 
your highness's commands shall be obeyed said the little lady making a low curtsey and she and her company passed out through the window which closed quietly behind them the dog stretched himself out upon the straw the little girl turned in her sleep and the moon shone in on the back garret the parlour maid was so much amazed and so eager to tell this great story to her mistress that she could not close her eyes that night and was up before cockcrow but when she told it her mistress called her a silly wench to have such foolish dreams and scolded her so that the parlour maid durst not mention what she had seen to the servants nevertheless child charity's aunt thought there might be something in it worth knowing so next night when all the house were asleep she crept out of bed and set herself to watch at the back garret door there she saw exactly what the maid told her the little men with the torches and the little ladies with the crystal lamps coming in making great reverence to the dog and the same words passed only he said to the one now prepare the presents and to the other prepare the jewels and when they were gone the dog stretched himself in the straw child charity turned in her sleep and the moon shone in on the back garret the mistress could not close her eyes any more than the maid from eagerness to tell the story she woke up child charity's rich uncle before cockcrow but when he heard it he laughed at her for a foolish woman and advised her not to repeat the like before the neighbours lest they should think that she had lost her senses the mistress could say no more and the day passed but that night the master thought he would like to see what went on in the back garret so when all the house were asleep he slipped out of bed and set himself to watch at the crevice in the door the same thing happened again that the maid and the mistress saw the little men in crimson with their torches and the little ladies in rose-coloured velvet with their lamps came in at the window and made an humble reverence to the ugly dog the one saying royal prince we have prepared the presents and the other royal prince we have prepared the jewels and the dog said to them all ye have done well to-morrow come and meet me and the princess with horses and chariots and let all things be in our first fashion for we will bring a stranger from this house who has never travelled with us nor feasted in our halls before the little men and the little lady said your highness's commands shall be obeyed when they had gone out through the window the ugly dog stretched himself out on the straw child charity turned in her sleep and the moon shone in on the back garret the master could not close his eyes any more than the maid or the mistress for thinking of this strange sight he remembered to have heard his grandfather say that somewhere near his meadows there lay a path leading to the fairies country and the haymakers used to see it shining through the grey summer morning as the fairy bands went home nobody had heard or seen the like for many years but the master concluded that the doings in his back garret must be a fairy business and the ugly dog a person of great account his chief wonder was however what visitor the fairies intended to take from his house and after thinking the matter over he was sure it must be one of his daughters they were so handsome and had such fine clothes accordingly child charity's rich uncle made it his first business that morning to get ready a breakfast of roast mutton for the ugly dog and carry it to him in the old cow house but not a morsel would the dog taste on the contrary he snarled at the master and would have bitten him if he had not run away with his mutton the fairies have strange ways said the master to himself but he called his daughter privately bidding them dress themselves in their best for he could not say which of them might be called into great company before nightfall child charity's proud cousins hearing this put on the richest of their silks and laces and strutted like peacocks from kitchen to parlour all day waiting for the call their father spoke of while the little girls scoured and scrubbed in the dairy they were in very bad humour when night fell and nobody had come but just as the family were sitting down to supper the ugly dog began to bark and the old woman's knock was heard at the back door child charity opened it and was going to offer her bed and supper as usual when the old woman said this is the shortest day in all the year and i am going home to hold a feast after my travels i see you have taken good care of my dog and now if you will come with me to my house he and I will do our best to entertain you. Here is our company. 
as the old woman spoke there was a sound of far-off flutes and bugles then a glare of lights and a great company clad so grandly that they shone with gold and jewels came in open chariots covered with gilding and drawn by snow-white horses the first and finest of the chariots was empty the old woman led child charity to it by hand and the ugly dog jumped in before her the proud cousins in all their finery had by this time come to the door but nobody wanted them and no sooner was the old woman and her dog within the chariot than a marvellous change passed over them for the ugly old woman turned at once to a beautiful young princess with long yellow curls and a robe of green and gold while the ugly dog at her side started up a fair young prince with nut-brown hair and a robe of purple and silver we are said they as the chariots drove on and the little girl sat astonished a prince and princess of fairyland and there was a wager between us whether or not there were good people still to be found in these false and greedy times one said yes and the other said no and i have lost said the prince and i must pay the feast and presents some of the farmer's household who were looking after them through the moonlight night said the chariots had gone one way across the meadows some said they had gone another until this day they cannot agree upon the direction the child charity went with that noble company into a country such as she had never seen for primroses covered all the ground and the light was always like that of a summer evening they took her to a royal palace where there was nothing but feasting and dancing for seven days she had robes of pale green velvet to wear and slept in a chamber inlaid with ivory when the feast was done the prince and princess gave her such heaps of gold and jewels that she could not carry them but they gave her a chariot to go home in drawn by six white horses and on the seventh night which happened to be christmas time when the farmer's family had settled in their own minds that she would never come back and were sitting down to supper they heard the sound of her coachman's bugle and saw her alight with all the jewels and gold at the very back door where she had brought in the ugly old woman the fairy chariot drove away and never came back to that farmhouse after the child charity scrubbed and scoured no more for she grew a great lady even in the eyes of her proud cousins end of chapter seventy two recording by phone